Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Well, not really. Today it's Middle East talk. Syria, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Sunni and Shia, ISIS and Islamic terror, a clash of civilization in the cradle of civilization. To help clarify a very complex and fast-moving situation is a frequent guest here, Richard Murphy, former U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Mauritania, the Philippines, and Syria. He has served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. He has been named Career Ambassador. He has been a senior fellow for the Middle East at the Council on Foreign Relations. And Ambassador Murphy is a frequent TV commentator and widely consulted expert. Welcome back, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. My favorite and most frequent guest. Okay. I've said this before. Where almost every time we meet, I'm confused. I'm really confused. So I fall back on my favorite anthem of the 60s. Something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. What's going on? Well, let's start by admitting that if you're confused, I'm even more confused. Because you know more. Well, I, I've been trying to keep up through the media, and there's been this deluge of commentaries, expert and some not ex so expert commentaries out there. And you've been in the region in the last month. Yeah, I was out in Lebanon in early September. Yeah. So <clears throat> what, what explains... Wait, let's do some definitions. I'm a professor. Okay. Just make, make sure we, all of us, understand what you're talking about. Let's start with Sunni, Shia, Sharia. Is that how you pronounce it? Sharia. Sharia, Caliphate, Jihad, and Salafism. So we got all those terms. Yeah. Start with Sunni and Shia because we've been talking about this forever. And it, in a sense, it's at the root of the conflicts. Well, uh those two terms define the basic uh, split or division in Islam between, call it the Orthodox, the Sunni, who said that the successor to the Prophet should be chosen by the wisest of men, the counselors who can find the best man to succeed Prophet Muhammad. Uh, the Shia said it should be a dis direct descent or the closest thereto okay. in a bloodline. And this led to a battle in the late 7th century. And the death of the uh, leader of that battle from the Shia side, they lost, is revered to this day uh, by the Shia. And there are processions throughout the countries where Shiism is dominant in his honor. So ultimately, what we're seeing in the Middle East, and in large measure, is a 1,400-year-old or 1,300-year-old well, conflict? It's, it's colored by that. Okay, so go it's ahead. It's colored by that. But it's, I say, a lot of it is a struggle for power. And, you know, in naked terms, you can see it in New York City politics if you want. You can see it around our country. Uh, that's certainly part of the backdrop of what, what's going on now. Elements frustrated that they haven't had any role, political role, frustrated that they don't have jobs, the youth in the Arab world. is a huge proportion of the population, and, yeah. they, and, and, they, and they don't have jobs. You pointed out early, in an earlier conversation that in India you have this huge youth population, but they're an economic resource, right. But, right. Un, but that's the, not the case. In the, in the Arab village. world, they're, they're a burden, and the governments are struggling to develop, diversify their economies uh, in a way that will create jobs, but it's not working fast. Okay, and, and before we actually get to ISIS, ISIL, the yeah. Islamic State, what is a caliphate? Which well, the, presumably this group or this state is attempting to create yeah. globally. The Arab word is khalif, the successor, the man designated to be in charge of Muslim um, the, the, the leader. And it's the a theocrat. 
Yeah, the successor to the prophet. Uh, and formally that ended in the early 1920s in Turkey, the last caliph was in charge. And there's been no one around really. Oh, you've had, you've had some people asserting they had such authority, but nobody doing it with such drama and flair as this uh, leadership in the Islamic State uh, uh, to have its leader proclaim himself as the caliph and that all Muslims should follow. And in, and in a sense, if taken literally, this means that their, their objectives are global rather than limited regionally. Well, they have rejected the titles of ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIS, the Islamic State of uh, uh, I Iraq and Syria, uh, to call themselves simply the Islamic, Islamic State. State. And f right now, it, they, they are in control of a sector of northern Syria, northwestern I Iraq. Now, one question is obvious. How did they move so quickly, organize territory, militarily take territory, defend the territory, in a sense, without the U.S. knowing. I mean, the Times reported that many missteps in assessment of ISIS threat. Explain, yeah. explain sort of the fog that led to them missing this, if there was a fog. Well, I think one possible explanation is that there was a, f we were focused on another aspect of the current mess in the Levant, in that area. And that was the government of Syria, mm -hmm. which uh, President Obama had said uh, that the president of Syria should step aside. This is three years ago. Right. Uh, he wasn't about to step aside, and that crisis continues. And under his leadership, there have been some 200,000 deaths in Syria. And you have a really fractionated opposition. Well, that's right. Uh, we spent a lot of energy trying to pull together those opposition elements to present a what I call a viable alternative to the regime in Damascus, and it hasn't worked. They're very individualistic, and there are on the field, on the battlefield, 150 separate units that don't, uh, don't come together under any single leader. And in the political side, a lot of people contending for leadership who just say, I'm the right one, take me. And ISIS comes out of this? No. Or ISIS, it, well, it, and it's, in a sense, it's allowed to form and, if you will, metastasize on, under the noses of? Well, it was one of the rebel groups. Uh, and I think uh, the times of today, of Tuesday, uh, sketches out outlines how it developed. It was one of the rebel groups, among many, and it was able to draw on some experienced military hands, such as Sunni leaders from the disbanded Iraqi army of Saddam Hussein. Which we disbanded immediately. Well, which we disbanded, and I think uh, the answer of anyone serving at that time has been, look, the army had dissolved itself. It had fallen apart. We just put a stamp on it. But that's history, and the historians are still looking at the facts uh -huh. on that. But uh, just to say that the Islamic State didn't spring out of nothing. It was able to draw in elements who have had military experience, command experience, and uh, are using it not necessarily in the long run loyal to the Islamic State. They're looking for the power that was denied them by the Shia-led government uh, in Baghdad. Okay. So we're back to the Shia-Sunni conflict, with Sunnis being, what, 90 percent of all Muslims yeah. wor worldwide? Yeah. Uh, centering on in Iran, <coughs> in Iraq, uh, up and down the Gulf, uh, in Lebanon, mm -hmm. and uh, to uh, in Syria. Okay, let's look at U.S. policy. What is U.S. policy? Is there a policy? Look, I, I was on a talk show yesterday for an Arabic language program out of Qatar, one of Al Jazeera's right. uh, talk shows. And what I didn't 
realized when we started it was it going to be a call-in show oh with people God. throwing questions from around the landscape. I, they didn't say which country they came from, but I can tell you they, the distrust of the United States. Why should we listen to you? We don't understand what you're doing. Uh, you disappointed us constantly over your handling of the Palestinian question. Uh, now you, you're dealing with General Sisi in Cairo. Why are you dealing with him? Because uh, uh, he is trying to destroy the Muslim Brotherhood, which many Egyptians uh, believe in. <clears throat> and all I could say at the, the, at the end of the program was, look, every country has its values and its interests, and it has to work out a balance, and it's constantly changing. Um, they were asking, is Egypt going to be providing the boots on the ground? Sure. I said, I don't know. I don't know. This, this decision probably hasn't been taken in Cairo. Turkey's still moving, studying the situation, but they're... But they're, they're key because they have they a long key. border with this emerging Islamic they're state. They're right there. They and they have, have the largest army in the region. A very disciplined uh, military force and... Is it in their strategic interest to become involved? Well, they're conflicted because uh, if they move across the border into the Arab world, sitting right there, uh, they get caught in uh, dealing with groups such as the PKK, which they have declared an enemy. And they've been fighting the PKK, which is a Kurdish group uh, now thrown out of Turkey operating in Syria fighting the regime in Damascus. Uh, <clears throat> it's complicated. It's, it is. That's. But Turkey's a key player and Egypt's a key player because yeah. essentially, the, the, at least the consensus that I'm sort of reading about is that the bombing can work in terms of disruption and maybe degrading, but to defeat and destroy, which was the president's stated objection, seems impossible. That well, that the, the statement of ends is really yeah. not commensurate with certainly the means. Petraeus comes out and says you need boots on, I mean, boots on the ground. The boots president boots. used two words, degrade and destroy. And I agree with the first, he can do that. To do that, he has to work with the government in Baghdad and keep pushing them to be bringing back Excuse into me. authority. Wait a second. The is, there a gov is there a government in, in, in well, Baghdad? Well, there, there is. Yes, there is. It's and uh, the former prime minister was, uh, seemed, well, they call him an exclusionist. He was a Shia first and foremost. And Maliki. He, Go ahead. Maliki. And he pushed, pushed the uh, Sunnis aside. And they, they've been... PO'd about that. <laughs> right, uh, right. And, and, and killing over it. Yeah. But you mentioned Turkey and Egypt, very important potential players. Don't forget Iran. Well, I, I, it seems to me, and, and others as well, that you can't deal with the situation without Iran. So you're going to have some kind of strange bedfellow phenomena here. The United States and Iran, in some sense, have mutual interests. Saudi Arabia and Iran have mutual interests. So is it recalibrating? What's happening here? Well, it makes for a very restless night. <laughs> and day. And day. <laughs> and day. Um, we are trying to keep the focus on the threat that is the Islamic State, IS, uh, to order throughout the Arab world, throughout the Muslim world. I mean, their ambitions are enormous, and their hopes are that we will be cast in the role of leader of the crusade. Right. And the crusade, that arouses some pretty basic emotions and I, sense of I would certainly say so. so. Okay, digression. These beheadings are outrageous and barbaric. Are they in some way an attempt to bring us into the crusade? Is it part of a oh, suckering yeah. process? I think so, exactly right. And and just and then and in a sense the media plays perfectly into that because all you see is twenty four seven of beheading. So there's it's part, I think there's an hysteria in part built up by the media hype of all this. Not to say that this is not serious and that as a viewer you watch it and say, kill them, kill their parents, kill their 
offspring kill their spouses. But that's not saying foreign policy. No, that's right. Well, the, uh, the beheadings certainly sparked the recent actions and decisions in Washington that it had to do something different from what President Obama has been trying to do for the last six years, which is to stay as far as possible from a potential war in the Middle East, a third war in right. the Middle East. He was reelected on that basis. Everyone that supported him was very enthusiastic about that. At the same time, they're saying, well, yeah, but uh, we've got a mission. We're, we're leaders in the world and we've got to do something. Uh, and, you know, we're kind of conflicted about the whole scene. Without question. Looking at the allies that the, the United States has put together in terms of the bombing of Syria, I guess, on September 23rd, which really represented another sort of step in, in this process. Previously, it had been limited to Iraq, and that was an earlier decision to, to actually get reengaged there. What's the impact? I mean, I'm a child of the 60s, and it just brings back images of Cambodia and Laos and the fruitlessness of that activity. Well, uh, IS has said it uh, has abolished national boundaries. And the headquarters for its operation, or the base of its operation, where it has grown steadily over the past year, is northern Syria. Mm -hmm. And that has fed, that fed and led to the attack on Mosul in northern Iraq. Which the Iraqi army just sort of disappeared. It, uh, it, totally. It caved and they, yeah, they, they left, they ran away. And that uh, is a big embarrassment for us, uh, having trained and armed, equipped them uh, for several years. What was the exact the direct cost of arming them and training them? $25 billion? Excuse me, bad investment. How do we let go, go back to uh, an earlier comment that you made? How can the United States reasonably expect Iraq, both its civilian government and its military, to provide any sort of stability and 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 forward progress, however defined? Well, uh, the scene is changing and. Uh, it's my understanding that six months ago, the idea uh, that Maliki as prime minister had just failed. Right. And in trying to create an exclusively uh, sectarian Shiite leadership had cost, uh, caused divisions in his own country, which could be extremely serious. The word from Tehran at that time, and I didn't uh, hear it directly, but the, it was reported the Iranians were saying, well, maybe he isn't the best, but uh, let's, let's, let's let time work, work it out. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, the Iranians got nervous about al-Maliki's performance in the last several months. Sure. And if it hadn't been for the pressure from their side, he probably uh, would still be in office. So they've changed their assessment, and now uh, working with the new Iraqi Prime Minister Ali Badi, uh, the emphasis from everybody seems to be you've got to build a really inclusive state or this is going to go to hell in a handbasket. Given your experience, knowledge, is, is that not the likely outcome? I don't know. I honestly to tell you I don't know because I have thought that since these states were created on the maps, you know, Sykes-Picot, First World War time, right. there's been almost a century of identity of Iraqis, of Syrians, of Lebanese, etc. Uh, I think that identity is still there. Syrians kind of look down on Iraqis and it's mutual and everybody looks down ah, on Lebanese. Uh, come on. Lots. But they there's a certain degree of, call it national feeling, mm -hmm. national pride. We'll, we'll see if it, it survived, but uh, whenever on a map you see a straight line, you know it's been, <laughs> it's been written by somebody who was wielding the power at that time, Dr. didn't Penn, reflect right. necessarily the divisions on the ground. What about Iran and Saudi Arabia and the United States, in, in, in a sense a triangle? You have 
the United States and Iran having mutual interest in this in, in this area, yep. certainly. And for the first time, you had relatively recently the heads of the uh, chief diplomats of both Iran and Saudi Arabia sitting down and talking. Yep. What does this potentially portend for the region? Well, uh, hopefully it's going to be a developing uh, dialogue based on the concern about IS, but leading to a, an improvement in the relationship overall. There's a lot of mistrust there, rivalries that certainly go back over the centuries sure. from, between Persians and Arabs, Wahhabis and uh, uh, the leadership uh, in Tehran. Mm -hmm. uh, stability in the area will depend heavily on whether that discussion about ISIS or uh, IS uh, could be the opening point of a new dialogue between the two of them, that uh, one isn't going to be really threatened by the other. It's, there are other problems in the world to face, and they, they should get on with them. What are they going to do with all those military weapons that they have targeted at each other? Well, they're using them <laughs> against IS at this point. Uh, whether they will, any, either of them will be providing the boots on the ground that we we'll keep hearing about isn't clear. As well as Egypt, as you mentioned As before. well as Egypt. Uh, I don't so there's know. a lot, a lot, a lot of unknowns here. Yeah. Yes. And it's constantly in flux. What about the larger strategic environment, Russia, China? The president really lashed out at both of those states uh, earlier in the yeah. week yeah. about their inactivity. What is there sort of a global, I know we've got sort of the, the, the uh, uh, Gulf Arab nations, small, not necessarily very democratic in, in the coalition. Yeah. Yeah. Where is, where is everybody else? France is involved, Britain's involved. What's, what's the global look? Well, as far as IS is concerned, I think we're on the same page with all of them. I mean, uh, the Chinese appear to be pretty distant and see this as a mess that would <laughs> rather not get involved in. Uh, Russia has had its problems, uh, serious ones, over the years with uh, extremist Muslims in Chechnya. Chechnya and they don't want to see a success story for IS that could be the seeds of a uh, further activity within their own areas. Uh, yeah, the president went after Russia in his uh, General Assembly speech focusing on the Ukraine. And I was in Moscow after I was in Lebanon for a conference and they are mighty <laughs> upset about our views on Ukraine, saying they've always recognized it as an independent state, etc. They just respect the decisions of the Russian people who right. yes, happen we, to be across the border. We understand the, the rationale. Yeah. Um, but uh, they've dedicated their support to the Assad regime in Damascus, seeing that as Long -time the, the bulwark. Yeah. 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 And uh, does that mean we can't work with Russia? Well, we, we can't work directly with Damascus. I think that's out of the question. Right, right. So if Russia is able to steer the Syrian regime to focus on IS, well, that, that's, that's useful. But the regime has played with the conflict itself. This is the Syrian regime. Right. Favoring ISIS at times fa over the Syrian free army. Sure. So given a choice, they've uh, preferred to deal with the devil that is IS and to b liquidate the Syrian free army. So by attacking IS, we're helping Assad. Uh, well, that's... There may be that's, a derivative yes, consequence. In the, in the short run. And in the short run, um, another extremist group, al-Nusra, in the uh, operating in Syria, which is tied to al-Qaeda, uh, al-Nusra said that, all right, the United States has now declared war on Islam and is leading a crusade against Islam. That's going to be the watchword. So we've got, we've got to be very careful on that side, and that's why we're putting energies into getting the support of these Sunni states. Sure. 
not trying to say Sunnis are better than Shia, but by getting the message across to the rebels in Iraq and Syria, look, we just think it's that IS leadership which has got to go. We are not anti-Sunni in any sense of the word. But we are anti-extreme totalitarian Islam. Yes. Okay. Yes. One, one, one question that I have to ask you as, as former ambassador. It seems to me that much of the extremism in the region, in the world, Islamic extremism, has its roots in Saudi Arabia. Comment. Well, uh, the Saudis are very proud to be called Salafis, those who follow the true path of Islam as defined by the, in the time, lifetime of the Prophet. And the revival of Salafism in the 18th century under a uh, leader called Abdul Wahhab, giving the name Wahhabism Wahhabi. to the, uh, to the uh, Saudi uh, interpretation of Islam as the correct interpretation. Uh, they have in their ranks some outrageous extremists. Well, I mean, 15 of the, the, the World Trade Center, D.C. We can never forget that. Terrorists. Uh, yeah. Does that represent the Saudi leadership? No. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of history there, and there's some very uh, determined, what we would call reactionary thinkers among uh, but, but not the only thinkers, they fund schools that preach this. Yeah. So it's, it's an active pro proselytizing. It's, it's not, it's, it's active. It's an active, um, well, uh, help me. Yeah, so, well, Saudi uh, once commented to me, it looks like we're funding and sending out the stupid to teach the ignorant. So as I say, there's That, that could be universally tensions. applied and we might end with that as our watchword for this particular show. I'm sure you'll be back shortly because this thing never changes. It's like General Hospital. So I thank you. My special thanks to Ambassador Murphy for helping us untie or retie the Gordian knot called the Middle East. Join us next week when my guest will be filmmaker Heather Quinlan. We'll talk about the 1986 New York Mets and her documentary about them here on CUNY TV. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.